Crystal and I were just talking about some moves that we've made in our lives. I'm sure you've made moves, maybe from your house to another house or to a new neighborhood. Uh, but our moves have been a little bigger than that, from one community to another, even from different provinces and out of uh, the country uh, over the course of our lives. And one of the things that comes up in that is the uncertainty that hits us when we're moving. Like, we came to here, Springville, uh, in Stouffville, uh, from Strathroy, and that, Strathroy was a great place to live. Yeah, there's a lot of uncertainties that come up. Like, is my are my are my kids going to be okay? Um, I remember sitting down and um, asking each one of them what they thought of this move. Yeah. And um, in fact, I read about it about four days ago in my journal. How each kid responded. We have three boys, and um, they all said, "Yeah, we'll support you." Easy to say, harder to do. But there was huge uncertainties. What with their school? One of our sons was just going into grade 10. The other two were going back to university, one going to Europe at the time. And um, there was so much uncertainty. I just felt like all the wheels were coming off. Yeah, I mean, we didn't know how, were we going to fit in? Was our son gonna fit in? But were we going to fit in? I mean, how would the church receive us? Would we connect? Would we, I mean, there was a great staff here before we came and they did a great job. I mean, well, we were gonna be the big failure and flop that came in after that. <laughs> Uh, and who would we get to know when we were here too? That was another concern. So there's, there's always uncertainties whenever you do something big like that. But it's not just moves that cause uncertainty. For some people, the uncertainty is, well, I want to move, but I don't know. I think maybe I should stay. That can be an uncertainty. Uh, another uncertainty can be uh, letting go of your child. Like they're growing up, they want to go to school, they want to leave your communities, so letting them go. Or letting go of a toxic relationship. That can be really hard. You, you like the person, but this thing is going south, and so uh, that's not a good thing. Or uh, letting go, standing up to a boss or, or an, an, um, a culture in a workplace. And if you stand up, you could be letting go of your job. Then there's uh, things like sometimes the uncertainty of obeying God. Well, oh, God's word says I should give, but I'm not sure what will happen. Will I have enough? Will God come through if I do give? Or God's word says I should reach out to my friend or my family member or my neighbor and share Jesus, but what if they ask a question I don't know? Or, or what if they reject me? Or what if they don't like what I'm saying to them? And if I do what God wants me to do, will he show up? And I think that's really probably the essence of our uncertainty is we're not sure God is going to show up. If we do what we're supposed to do, will God come through? Well, actually, he's already answered that question in Psalm 121. Listen to the word of God as uh, David wrote it. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Remember, Jerusalem's surrounded by mountains. And he goes, where does my help come from? Obviously, he's asking for help. He must be in need. And he settles it. He says, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who created everything, the one with all power. That's where my help will come from. Now he starts thinking about God. He won't let your foot slip. Why? Well, he watches over you and he does not slumber. In fact, indeed, he watches over all Israel, all his people, and he neither slumbers nor sleep. He's always attentive. The Lord watches over you, the writer says. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun won't get through him and harm you, and the moon won't harm you by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. I don't know if you noticed it in there, but five times David uses the word shamar, watch, watch over. Shamar means to attentively look at, to keep your eye on, to guard. In fact, uh, the truth of this psalm is that God says, I'll be your bodyguard. I'm going to watch over So when we, when our boys were younger and we were family, Crystal and I would often take them bike riding and usually there was a park like this somewhere along the way and we would stop and the boys would play in the park. Now we didn't leave them at the park and say, hey, we'll be back in a half hour, uh, have fun and then take off. 
Uh, instead, we would park our bikes and we would go just off to the side where we could see them clearly. And we would watch over them in case one of them got hurt or maybe a bully came or an adult that was weird. And we were protecting them. We were guarding them, making sure that they were okay. In verse 7 of Psalm 121, the author says, He will keep you from all harm. Now, it's easy to think, well, I, I, God, I've got harm in my life right now. I, I've got pain, things that are really hurting my family, my health, my finances, my fears, what's going on. Like, how can you say God will keep me from all harm? But that's where we have to realize the next truth of this passage. Hurt and harm are not the same thing. But the term harm Naka in Hebrew actually means destruction. It, it, a picture of harm was a, an invading uh, army would come in and they would attack a city and break down the walls and they would go through the walls and they would uh, kill and, and plunder and rape and destroy. And when they were done, there was nothing left of the city. It was absolutely broken and destroyed. And God is promising not that we won't go through hurt, but that we will go, never go through harm. Everything that comes to us must first go through him. In fact, uh, this expectation that we have that, oh, if I follow Jesus, everything will be easy. I mean, well, I'll have hard times, but it won't be too difficult. Or I won't really go through bad failure, or my family won't suffer real hurt. Uh, that expectation is not at all uh, shared in scripture. God says, in fact, God says the opposite thing. Isaiah, when he was writing, he said, Lord, by such things people live and my spirit finds life in them to, too. You restored me to health and let me live. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffered such anguish. And just before that, he said, I will walk humbly all my years because of the anguish of my soul. Over in Isaiah chapter 42, God writes, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they'll not sweep over you. And when you walk through fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Don't miss the fact that they're going to walk through floods and fires, that things are going to be overwhelming sometimes. And that's part of God's plan. But you see, hurt, things that hurt us, are not the same as things that harm us. In fact, God says everything comes through him because he has purpose in what comes into our lives. And he has a purpose to change us and to grow us and to make us new people. Over in Hebrews chapter 12, the writer writes, endure hardship. God expects that that would be part of our Christian life as discipline. God is treating you as children for what children are not disciplined by their father. And then he tells us why he does. He says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. Well, there's an understatement, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. You see, the reality is hurt in our life isn't a sign that God isn't with us. It's a sign that God is growing us and making us better. Years ago, my nephew Curtis led Sylvia to Christ and then he later married her. Now, Sylvia didn't come from a home or a family that followed Jesus. And one of the most difficult things for Syl Sylvia over to overcome in her faith journey was to accept that God had allowed her mom to die at 41 years of age when Sylvia was very young. Sylvia's mom battled with cancer for a year and she watched her slowly getting worse and worse in deep pain until her mom finally died. Now Sylvia struggled to trust God since he hadn't come through uh, for her in that time and, and in that pain. But years later, a friend of Sylvia's mom uh, was meeting with Sylvia and they were talking and her mom said, her friend said, uh, I don't know if you knew this or not, but your mom trusted Jesus as her savior in the final months of her lives. It was the pain that she was in that had led her to understand that she needed to put her faith in Jesus for the salvation of her sins and to be reconciled with God. And once uh, Sylvia had that understanding, it changed her paradigm on what her mom went through and what she went through in watching mom died. And now she says and writes, I believe the Lord used my mom's desperation and sickness to show her that she needed a savior. It was through the most painful time of her life that she called out to Jesus, praise the Lord. You see what Sylvia thought was harm was in fact hurt with a purpose to bring benefit. And that leads us to our third truth that comes out of this. 
God guards us like a bodyguard, hurt is not the same as harm, and that this God is good and he always does good. So God is good and he always does good. You know, uh, verse two says that my help comes from the Lord. And then verse eight says, the Lord watches over my coming and going both now and forevermore. God is there. He, everything passes through him and, and he, he allows hurt in our lives um, that won't harm us. And what he's doing is good. And that's the belief part. That's where the choice to believe God comes in. Do I trust him that what he is doing, though it's hurtful in my life, that will actually bring benefit? You know, Jesus had to ask that same question or go face that same question because in the garden of Gethsemane, there he was praying and he was saying to God, please take this from me. Please take the beatings I'm going to go through, the attacks I'm going to go through, the murder that I'm going to go through, and then the separation from you that I'm going to go through. Take it from me. But nevertheless, he said, not my will, but yours. And at that moment, Jesus had to choose, is God good and does he always do good even if I can't see it? Will I choose to trust him or am I going to choose to let the uncertainty and the fear of my life control me? So what do we do about this as we go forward? Where do we go from here? Four words. First, identify. We've got to identify where uncertainty and fear are controlling our lives. What situation, what person, what thing is it that we are going through that God is causing us to doubt God or causing us to wonder if God is there? Identify it. Maybe you do a shout out here and you go to a friend or a, a spiritual leader or a counselor and, and clarify and identify what it is that's causing the unrest in your soul, causing you to doubt God, make you to fear God. The second word I would say is then ask. You know, Jesus asked that it all pass away from him. Now with Jesus, the father said, no, you must go through this. But other times in scripture, people ask and God delivers them. And so why don't you ask? There's nothing stopping you from asking. Go to God as a child and just say, God, take this from my life. Sometimes he does. Well, if he doesn't, then uh, the third word is to trust. So this is where you get to choose and where you need to choose. Are you going to trust that God is truly your bodyguard, that he is good and always does good, and anything that comes into your life, even though it's hurtful, will never be harmful. In fact, it'll be beneficial. Trusting will sometimes mean waiting, waiting for God to see this through. Sometimes it's a week, sometimes it's a month, sometimes it's years. But we're always brought back, do we believe that God is good and that he always does good? And we need to trust him. The fourth word I would say is if you're in a trust situation is act. Don't just sit pa pa uh, passively and wait for this all to end. And you can turn bitter or angry and that can grow in your spirit, but instead act. Find someone that you can serve. Find someone in fact that maybe is going through your uncertainty and your fears and w walk with them and together pray to, or maybe you encourage them and lift them up. But don't remain passive, act. Act with the opportunities God gives you. So identify what's really happening in your life. Ask God to remove it. And if he doesn't, then trust him. And then if you have to trust him, don't go on hold. Act. Put your faith into action. You're trusting God. Let me pray with you. Jesus, today, you modeled for us what it means to choose faith over fear, to choose faith in our uncertainty. And I ask that anybody that's struggling with uncertainty and the fear that you will not show up will listen to what this psalmist write and that will put their faith in you, that you are good and you always do good. And any hurt that comes into our life will not harm us, but will in fact benefit us. And so now we trust ourselves to you.
wherever you are, just receive these words. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know I am. Be still. Peace.